was declared the last of the demons defeated. For man is the lord of the air. Arise, O man, in thy strength. The kingdom is thine to inherit. Till the high gods witness at length that man is the lord of his spirit. That high intoning style, that faint trace of cockney, that touch of the McGonagall's blended with more than a hint of someone taking themselves very seriously indeed. It all adds up to the voice and poetry of Alistair Crowley, known successively as the Great Beast of Revelation, 666, the King of Depravity, and the Wickedest Man in the World. But how much truth is there in these extraordinary claims? To help me find out, I've spoken to people who've studied Crowley's life and who knew him during his career as a black magician and founder of his own religion, Crowleyanity. Robin Cecil encountered the Great Beast towards the end of his life. What impression did Crowley make on him? Crowley was a man who posed as what he was once called the wickedest man in the world, but that was not my observation of him. Obviously one had to sup with Crowley with a very long spoon. Crowley's currency was sex and money, and by the time I met him he had no money and I think was pretty run down as far as sex was concerned as well. There must have been a period of Crowley's life when he had a certain fascination, not just for, for women, but for some of these men like Victor Newberg and Norman Mudd and others who did certainly suffer at his hands. But he was just as capable of posing as the English gentleman, an ornament of polite society. Angela York knew him socially and was struck by his presence. I perceived that he had charisma, and one could see that he had it with other people too. There were so many people that came within his net who he attracted, which is really the answer what charisma means, doesn't he? He attracted people. More later about Crowley's social graces as a regular luncheon guest. But Arthur Calder Marshall, a friend of the ill-fated Victor Newberg, was not impressed by Crowley. When I first saw Mark Crowley, I thought, he's the man to let you down. I think he was corrupt from the word go. I think he used magic uh, in order to gain power. But he did believe that it really worked. I'm quite certain right to the end he believed it worked. And he uh, might say magical power is greater than me. Uh, but uh, uh, equally he would uh, sacrifice a victim in order to gain more supernatural power. Very dangerous if you were foolish enough to believe in him. Two useful clues there, I think, to Crowley's complex personality. A man who was continually posing, and a man who would always let you down. But even in the distinguished company of Corvo, Leadbeater, Bottomley, whose paper John Bull attacked him, and his friend Frank Harris, who tried to go into partnership with him, each thinking the other had access to money, Crowley still manages to stand out as a larger-than-life character of considerable gifts who squandered them in a massive way. The problem in trying to gain any true picture of the man is that his name is surrounded by as many fictions as facts. Fiction, it must be said, that he was perfectly willing to promote. Did he really contact elemental spiritual forces, or was it all a particularly adroit confidence trick? Should he bear some responsibility for the series of breakdowns and on occasion suicides and deaths suffered by his followers? But let's go back to his origins. Alistair Crowley produced many versions of his upbringing and ancestors, but the truth appears to be that he was born in Leamington in 1875, the son of the brewer of Crowley's Ales. Having sold out for a very large sum of money, Alistair's father decided to devote his life to the propagation of the beliefs of the Plymouth Brethren, beliefs which, according to one of Crowley's biographers, Francis King, were faithfully passed on to his only son. Well, Alistair Crowley was convinced of the absolute truth of the Plymouth Brethren doctrines, that, you know, a Church of England church was a place of satanic worship, nobody was going to be saved who wasn't a fellow Plymouth brother, etc., etc. And I think what, you know, at the risk of sounding faintly fraudulent, the great shock was when his father died, when he was about 11, then he was brought up by his mother and various uncles, who were equally fanatical evangelicals. And then his life was transformed by going off to public school, and he tactfully describes this in his confessions as my health broke down, or perhaps he describes this bit in, in an introduction to a book called The World's Tragedy. Somewhere he writes that his health broke down, he had to leave the school. And in the margin he wrote, I caught the clap from a whore in so-and-so. He got one rear, it was about 
15, and his mother thought this was a sign it was enormously wicked, and told him that he was a beast of revelations. Now, I can't believe jokingly, but you know, I think she probably said, you know, you're in danger of becoming the beast of revelations, or like the beast of revelations, but he seriously identified himself with this, and in a sense he identified himself with this for the rest of his life. This may sound a somewhat grim childhood, but in fact, young Edward Alexander Crowley, he had not yet altered his name to Alistair, was a rather indulged little boy. After public school, he spent three happy years at Cambridge. He seemed to have all the qualifications for success. He was good-looking, he had considerable private means, and was clearly extremely talented. He wrote poetry. Two of his poems were accepted by the Oxford Book of Mystical Verse. He was a first-class chess player. He was a daring and resourceful mountain climber. It was almost an embarrassment of riches. But in which direction should his destiny lie? Like many others of his time, including Frederick Rolfe, the subject that seemed to really exercise his imagination was the study of the occult. Arthur called a marshal. He was a typical man of the 90s of Oscar Wilde. As an undergraduate, he read Baudelaire's Fleur de Mal and Joris Calvi's Franz Labar. And the idea of the cult of evil as a positive protest against Victorian Church of England dullness. You know, it really seemed to be romantic. And I think he went into it as an undergraduate, feeling that anything that he could do as a protest against 19th century smugness was a blow struck for vitality and the new life and so on. Also, of course, a reaction against these very puritanical uh, Plymouth Brethren parents. So Crowley decided to join a magical group, the Order of the Golden Dawn. The founders were three men. Wynne Westcott, who was a coroner in northeast London, a rather elderly Freemason called Woodman, who did very little else after founding the Order except to drop dead, and the real driving force of it, a man called... Mathers. Now, Mathers, who seems to have been born, Samuel Little Mathers, the son of a London merchant's clerk, took up study of occultism at a very early age and was also fascinated, like people like Yeats, by the Celtic revival. To the extent in Mathers' case, he started calling himself first McGregor Mathers and then Mathers McGregor and then Count McGregor of Glenstrike. Crowley joined it in 1897 and everybody in it, Crowley among them, went through various rituals which initiated them were given manuscripts teaching them how to see elementals, to practice a form of divination called geomancy, to, to raise the gods by very complex magic ceremonies, etc. And matters got more and more autocratic. And eventually there was a rebellion against him. Initially, Crowley took Mathers' side. Then he too fell out with him. Whatever the reason for this falling out, this pattern of strong involvement followed by violent dissension and a good deal of unpleasantness was to repeat itself again and again in Crowley's life. He decided to abandon the Golden Dawn and travelled in the East, disguised as a Persian prince. At this point came the event which Crowley believed was to shape the rest of his life. Until 1904, really, Crowley had played around. I mean, he had played with magic and he played with Buddhist mysticism and... You know, he'd done a lot, but he'd also written a lot of poetry, etc. And in 1904, he went off to Egypt with his wife, who was the sister of Gerald Kelly, who later became president of the Royal Academy, the daughter of the Vicar of Camberwell, just the sort of person one might expect Crowley not to marry, and of course he did. And he went there, and with her, he conducted various magic ceremonies simply for fun. You know, his diary shows he did it for fun decided to show Rose a magic ceremony. And in the course of this, he got what he believed until the end of his life to be an authentic message from the gods, telling him that a new age had started, something very much like what the astrologers talk about when they say the Aquarian Age, and that he was to be the prophet of this new age, a prophet of force and fire. And I think, in a way, he tried to reject this revelation or domination or psychotic illness, whatever you like to consider it. He tried to reject it at first and do other things. But by 1909, it had sort of captured him, this very curious prose poem, which he wrote, he says, at the dictation of a supernatural being. And uh, the rest of his life really followed on from that. The Book of the Law can justifiably be called Crowley's Bible, since it was offered as the centrepiece of Crowleyanity and had to be taken on trust by the faithful. 
The basic message had the simplicity and directness of a good advertising slogan. Buddhism, Islam and Christianity had got it all wrong. Crowleyanity was to be the religion of the New Age with Crowley as its prophet. The central dogma of the new religion was to be complete self-fulfillment. The maxim which has become more strongly identified with Crowleyanity, do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law, actually comes from the writings of Rabelais, who in his turn had taken it from St. Augustine. But Crowley made one significant alteration. The original reads, love God and do as you will. In other words, if you love God, all your acts will serve to please him. On the other hand, says Robin Cecil, if you subtract the phrase love God, you are left with no will except your own. And your own will then uh, takes advantage and exploits other people. And the religious concept disappears. Because for Crowley, religion was, if you like, the worship of Crowley. Uh, his own egoism was elevated to that of kind of monstrous idol, which other people were expected to worship. Crowley was at this time still only in his late twenties, and decisions still had to be made as to where his destiny lay. In the event, he seems to have abandoned plans to become the greatest chess player, poet, or mountain climber of his generation, in favour of throwing in his lot with a world of magic. It's hard to know whether he genuinely thought that this was his greatest gift, or simply decided to be pragmatic by trying to shine in a field that offered very little competition. For he was clearly desperate for recognition and attention, and a place in society. He had drifted about trying to find his destiny. Now, it seemed, with the revelations of the Book of the Law, he had found it. By 1908 or 109, it, it captured him. He devoted his life to this. And from this time, the way he drifts about is drifting about in a rather different way, not drifting about with different interests, but drifting about because he is possessed by the belief that he is, in a sense, moved by the gods, that he interpreted everything that happened to him as a direct relationship or a direct revelation of the gods to him. So when he met somebody in a bus or a ship uh, while staying at a hotel, the man might say something, Crowley would see this other person as a messenger from the gods. Not consciously so, but he, he believed. He drifted about as he believed the gods wished him to drift about. A good many people were trying to establish new religious systems at this time. The theosophist Bishop Leadbeater was making his own bid for recognition. He caused Crowley, in a bad attack of pot-abusing kettle, to savage the bishop as a senile sex maniac proclaiming his catamites as the coming Christ. To Crowley, his own system of belief at least had some logical philosophical basis. Robin Cecil. Crowley believed that there were forces at work in the world which had not yet been detected and which were invisible and intangible. That some of these forces, quite ordinary forces like electricity, like wavelengths if you like, had been discovered recently and others would be discovered. And that the purpose was to get into touch with these forces. And there were two ways of doing this, because the forces were external, and to that extent you needed ceremonial magic as a means of getting in touch with them. But also, you had to attune yourself, and the instrument for doing this was yoga. And there were therefore these two prongs, if you like, to the Crowleyan fork. The one to tackle the external world, which was magic, and the one to tackle the inner world, which was the inner discipline of yoga. The immediate consequence of the revelation of the Book of the Law was that Crowley felt obliged to found his own occult fraternity called the AA. A magician, as one of Crowley's biographers, John Simons, has remarked, must have an order, just as a politician must have a party. In the early days, at least, Crowley never had any trouble in attracting followers, and it was thus that Victor Newberg, a bright young undergraduate, became his pupil. The relationship illustrates more clearly the power that Crowley was able to exert over other people's wills. Not only did Newberg agree to participate in a new, particularly unpleasant, ten-day crash course in practical magic, but was actually prepared to go on working with Crowley for five years afterwards. The crash course included Newberg sleeping naked for ten nights on gorse bushes, 
and being beaten intermittently with furze branches and stinging nettles by Crowley himself, with whom he also had sexual relations. When Newberg finally broke with Crowley, he was ritually cursed by him and suffered a nervous breakdown, which was to affect his health for the rest of his life. Clearly completely unmoved by this, Crowley then turned his mind to other forms of magic, in particular to an order called the OTO, the Order of Eastern Templars, a fraternity which taught that sexual orgasm could be used as a way of achieving the divine union. As Crowley possessed a vast and quite indiscriminate bisexual sex drive, he found this idea peculiarly attractive. Crowley never gave any instruction in, in sex magic, as far as I know, except to the women with whom he slept. He never gave out this as a form of, of instruction, though one will find in his written works, particularly memoirs of a drug addict, or frequent references to this so-called sacred act. I think probably what lay behind this idea of sex magic was the undoubted fact that the sexual energies are among the most powerful energies that the human being possesses. For example, sex energy is far more powerful in the sense of actual moving of mountains than intellectual energy. And it's a particular form of emotional energy, which undoubtedly is very forceful. And I think this is why Crowley, in trying to exercise his will and encouraging others to exercise their will, emphasized sex energy. Unfortunately, of course, there is no place in this creed for woman as anything else but a victim. And in that sense, the uh, whole of what has sometimes been called Crowleyanity is uh, impregnated with uh, male chauvinism. And male chauvinism, it must be said, of a curiously demoralizing kind. Crowley's role as the great beast demanded the constant presence of a woman prepared to be his great whore of Babylon, his ape of Thoth, or his scarlet woman. A surprising number of women volunteered to take on these unattractive and unappetizing roles, and not surprisingly, numbers of them ended up with drink problems, nervous breakdowns, and actual insanity. Yet there always seemed to be another woman ready to take on the inevitable byproducts which a relationship with Crowley always involved. These included violence, homelessness, insecurity, quite often pregnancy, and inevitable desertion to which one can add the more positive disadvantages of a digestion ruined and a spirit humiliated by the ingestion of body substances. But male chauvinism was just one of Crowley's less attractive features to add to his general bigotry and anti-Semitism. Yet Crowley's intellectual system, his Abbey of the Will, is really no more improbable than any other religious systems thrown up by the flower-powered sixties. The trouble seems to have been that Crowley never grasped the fact that if you want to start a new religion, it is fatal to quarrel with all your followers. How on earth are you to get together a congregation, let alone staff and finance the propagation of the word? Crowley never had any trouble in attracting followers. The problem was keeping them. And after the incident at Chefaloo, where Raoul Loveday, a Crowley neophyte, actually died, it became harder than ever to attract the right sort of person. Francis King. Chefaloo, as you know, was where Crowley had his abbey, which was a rather scruffy, disused farmhouse where various disciples came out to him. And it really hit the headlines when a disciple called Raoul Loveday, who got a first at Oxford, died in mysterious circumstances. Now, on to this leapt the Daily Express and John Bull. Um, John Bull's circulation had dropped quite sharply since its founder and owner, um, Horatio Bottomley, had gone to prison, so it was jolly good to find a nice wicked man in the shape of Crowley. And I think what happened was that quite simply Raoul Loveday caught enteritis from drinking dirty water and died of enteritis. That dirty water certainly can't have helped, but I suspect it was the chaser of freshly slaughtered cat's blood which ultimately did for poor Raoul. Crowley continued until his death in Hastings in 1947 in the same zigzag pattern. Life was a constant series of new involvements, new schemes, new disciples, 
money problems, litigation and the copious consumption of drugs, particularly cocaine and heroin. Crowley had initially taken drugs as a shortcut to the higher consciousness, enabling him, in a phrase of the times, to loosen the girders of the soul. But the problem, as Crowley was to discover, was that if you loosen the girders of the soul too often, the whole edifice begins to tilt in the most alarming way. So perhaps it's not surprising that when, in 1939, Robin Cecil, then a fresh-faced youth in his twenties, met Alistair Crowley, who was then in his sixties, he describes him as a ruin, bloated yet ravaged. Crowley's health was failing, but he was still on the lookout for new followers, convinced that he would still get the recognition he deserved, that somehow someone was going to turn up. Getting to know Crowley was rather like exploring a ruin. Ruins have always fascinated me. Uh, Crowley always thought that I had been uh, attracted by his personality and that I'd made all the running. I don't think this is really true, but Crowley thought that for me this had been a very important episode in my life. And as soon as he found that I was quite interested in the ideas he had to peddle, um, one of the first things he instructed me to do was to write a short history of my life culminating in the moment at which I had met him, because in his view this was a culmination for me. Robin Cecil wisely concluded that however interesting these ideas appeared to be, that here was a man who should be treated with the utmost caution. Later on, when he stayed alone in Crowley's flat in German Street, he found the atmosphere of the place deeply depressing, as though reflecting the underlying melancholy and frustrations of the owner. In spite of the fact that I was dead tired and that one was missing a lot of sleep for other reasons, I found myself caught up in a sort of miasma. I felt the whole atmosphere of this place laden with the frustrations of a lifetime. And I think Crowley got to me through the suffering w which had imbued the very walls and furniture of this flat of his, and which I was capable of sensing. And so, although perhaps I never got a very good grasp of uh, Crowleyanity, I did have a, a, a feeling that this was a man of great potential, who had lived a sad and wasted life. Yet in old age, Crowley was still just as capable of assuming roles as he had been in his youth. He was particularly fond of posing as the English gentleman and could still turn up correct in every detail for lunch. Angela York. I did like Alistair Crowley. Uh, my husband used to have him to the house once a week and we used to give him lunch. And he used to, instead of, you know, one has this picture of him with his strange clothes and curly slip, but not at all. He used to arrive in beautiful cut tweeds and the tweeds were made by some woman who used to weave them for him. And he, his conversation uh, was very normal. I was a very conventional young woman, and um, I would have been shocked, I'm sure, if I'd heard anything, but I wasn't at all. Later, we, he came to us in Cambridge, and then I had a child of three. And what I was very struck was, he was so nice to the little boy. He had a, pe you know, he had one of those pencils you had in those days, a gold pencil that had little bands that you push them up, and a red pencil came out, or a blue pencil, or a black pencil. And he sh I remember him showing John, this thing and John being fascinated. Yet the sinister and manipulative side of Crowley's personality was never far below the surface, as Arthur Calder Marshall recalls. When I met him in Sudix, he was sitting there and I thought, my God, you're a phony. He did not impress me as anything more except somebody who was out to get something out of me. Uh, he obviously felt that here was somebody who, if he could possibly induce him to come down and act as a sort of neophyte like he'd made uh, Raoul Loveday and uh, Victor Newberg, he was on to a good thing. Arthur Calder Marshall accepted the invitation and saw Crowley's techniques of persuasion in action. He invited me down because he wanted me, obviously, to spend the night and he would, if possible, hypnotize me, give me drugs, make me tight, uh, and see if he could seduce me into becoming a neophyte. But instead of that, I went down 
with a girlfriend of mine who drove me down, which absolutely infuriated Crowley. Crowley <laughs> didn't know how to get rid of this girl, and so he summoned his wife, who was about his fourth or fifth, uh, a Brazilian woman who looked as though she was dressed for a brothel. She, uh, and she came down in a black and white, long evening dress and high heels. And this woman was sent out to the garden uh, with my girlfriend. It was October to look at the Brussels sprouts in slight drizzle. Well, Crowley seated me at a table. He was smoking specially strong little Brazilian cigarettes wrapped in Indian corn uh, sheaths. And uh, he plied me with brandy and talked to me very earnestly indeed, looking into my eyes as hard as possible. And I realized that he was trying to hypnotize me. And I knew that it, uh, if he'd had me all night, uh, I might have given way if I got tight. But I knew I also had Eleanor out in the garden who was going to come back, rescue me, and take me to London in uh, her car. But I did realize at that point that if he got you alone, Crowley was a very sinister man. With a character as complex as Crowley's, can there ever be any kind of final summing up? I think during his life, one would have to write him off as a magical failure. He ended life, after all, still a magician, in a Hastings boarding house, writing curses in the bathroom of the loo. And one just feels pathetic old black magician. But, in fact, you know, uh, wickedness survives. Crowley, whom I thought after his death would be written off as a sort of complete clown, has revived his cult. Uh, Charlie Manson, who ritually massacred Sharon Tate, claimed to be a follower of Crowley, and I believe in the United States, as in England, there is the, I think it's called the OTO, uh, which is a form of the uh, Crowley worship. So Crowley's reputation has survived his death, and to a certain extent has grown and become internationally known. His magical order still flourishes in several countries, notably in the United States, where it has a monthly newsletter, The Magical Link, and Gnostic Masses, followed by potluck lunches afterwards for the Californian followers of Crowleyanity. So, what is the final summing up of Crowley? A man of considerable talents who squandered them all? Or an authentic new prophet who went unrecognized in his own time? Or simply a very nasty, plausible con man who just wanted power at any price? Above all, will he be remembered? Francis King thinks it's too soon to judge. Certainly from the point of view of most of us who, you know, have jobs and pay a mortgage and you know, want to be a member of the Roman District Council or something, the man used them in an utterly futile way. Um, whether this will be the view of someone in 200 years is, is a different matter. That was the fourth programme in our series, The Mischief Makers. Taking part were Arthur Calder Marshall, Robin Cecil, Francis King, Angela York, and the voice of Alistair Crowley himself. It was presented by Francis Donnelly and produced by Graham Tyre. Next week, at the same time, you can hear the last programme in the series.